Hi, everybody. This is Lisa, and this episode has been a long time coming. And I've been trying to figure out what the best way to say it, what the best way to do it. And finally, I was just like, I have got to just pull the curtain back and let you know what's been going on sort of behind everything for me. Um, the name of this episode is Tests, Allies, and Enemies, which is one of the stages in Joseph Campbell's uh, Hero's Journey. I have basically been tested and in a totally foreign land um, for the duration, the whole entire time that this podcast has been a podcast. Um, I, you know, after the death of Derek and Michael, the deaths of Derek and Michael, um, I entered a special world and I was surviving it. And, um, with the huge, huge support of a very good friend of mine. And that friend has now <laughs> betrayed me and kind of turned on me. And this is a friend from, you know, like teen teenage years, like from a long time ago, long time friend. And, um, and it's, what's weird about all this is that I sensed, obviously, all of this stuff going on. But when I would try to talk to him about it, he would deny it and he would just gaslight the situation like, no, why? Why would anything be going on? And so, you know, there's sort of like three people, main people in my life, probably, you know, there's like my brother, there's Derek, and then there's this other person. And um, I mean, there's a couple other, thank God, um, that are really there for me and that I love and you know, all that stuff. But this person was pretty key to my life for many years, all my adult life. And when I was trying to understand what I was feeling, especially doing this podcast, because this podcast is very much about me being honest with you and sharing the journey. And I, and I was trying to give this person the benefit of the doubt that I was maybe, maybe they just were having a hard time explaining what was going on, or, you know, maybe they still didn't know. Um, they had dealt with loss during that time, during the time I've had this podcast. So there was a lot going on and I didn't really, I just knew something was going on and it was, it was extremely disorienting to me and hurtful. And, um, so since the fire, which in August will be a year, has been the most challenged time of my life, aside from dealing with the death of Derek and the death of Michael. Um, and the thing that sucks is that this person has chosen to do this to me, whereas, you know, Derek and Michael didn't choose to die. They still love me. They still think I'm great. They still, you know, when the last time I saw them or talked to them, everything was good. It wasn't a, a choice. They wouldn't, they didn't choose to hurt me. Whereas this person is making that choice. And that's really hard for me to understand. And it's, it's going to take me the rest of my life to wrap my brain around that because, you know, I like really love this person and I would have taken a bullet for them. And I did take many bullets for them. Um, and it's, it's just hard to understand when someone just decides to go a different route. And I think that it's going to happen in life and, um, we just have to keep going. And I just really, I mean, I wrote some notes and it's just, I can't read from the thing cause that's just going to be weird. So I'm just kind of hopefully going to touch on everything, but I just want to tell you that for the past year, or just shy of a year, I have been completely shattered. It fully, actually, it fully shattered for me probably at the beginning of this year. Um, but pieces were breaking off from the inside because I knew something was going on with this person. I knew it. But there was so much else going on all around you know, coronavirus and then the wildfire and just so much stuff going on that I I couldn't isolate it and see it for what it was. But um, some things have come to light in the past few months and 
Now it's painfully clear that I was right. There was something going on and that the person is intending to hurt me and to kind of like publicly talk shit about me. And I also want to say that's not the goal of this episode. I'm not trying to, you know, talk badly about somebody. Um, that's why I'm being very vague about who it is and, uh, you know, protecting their privacy. And I'm just not that, I don't want to do that. And, you know, but anyways, so that's not my goal. My goal in talking to you right now about this is so that you can understand if you felt something when you were listening to me, um, you were accurate. You know, there really was this huge thing going on that I couldn't talk about. And, um, partly because I was trying to protect their privacy, but then also I was still trying to work it out. Like, what exactly am I getting from this? And, you know, it's weird when we are deceived on one level or like with one situation in our lives, we almost attract deception. I, I've never had so many people completely like screw me over than I've had during the whole time that this thing has been going on with this person. And it's really weird. Like I've never felt such a direct assault on me as an individual. And some of it's probably because I'm coming off of, you know, dealing with the losses and I'm, I'm putting myself out in the world in a different way than I ever have before. So that just naturally is going to bring out people who don't like that or who try to smash you down. Um, but but I do believe because there was this big deceiving kind of vibe going on in such a huge way in the core part of my life, like a very, very close friend, I think it just sort of, it, 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 it sent out this energy field that was like, you know, that I'm not protected because I wasn't fully seeing it clearly for the, for several years. It's been going on for about five years and uh, maybe even longer. And the more that I'm you know, breaking everything down and thinking about everything that's happened and conversations, little micro moments, conversations, uh, comments in passing, you know, I'm really realizing that this person may have been lying to themselves, maybe all of their adult life. And, you know, they gave up on their dream. That's another thing I was helping them with their dream. And, you know, they, I think that's part of all this. I think that that's, and that's sort of like one of the dangers that if you're in this world where you're pursuing your dreams and maybe you're going to have your friends that also are pursuing their dreams, if for whatever reason they decide they don't want to do it anymore, they might try to make you look bad because they don't want to face like, oh, I'm a failure. I gave up on something that was important to me. Like they don't want any of the ridicule. It's the ego. It's the ego going, I don't want to look bad. So I'll do whatever I have to do to protect myself. And, you know, I, I do expect that from general people, but I guess I didn't expect that from this person because I so loved 100% purely with my heart. Like there was no deception. There was no part of me that was like, yeah, I'm going to get over on this person. Like nothing, like not even remotely. And, um, it was, it's, it's shocking to my system. I think that's why it's taking me so many kind of like years to look at this clearly and like, wait, what? And like, there's such drastic, um, actions that have happened and, you know, since the fire, but definitely, you know, since the beginning of this year that makes it undeniable at this point. And so it's almost made me not want to live anymore. And I'm a completely broken person right now. All of the pieces of me are here. They're in my hands. I've got them, but they're in a million pieces. I'm completely shattered by this person, by their choices and their, their choice to be hurtful, I guess, um, because it comes with a lot of other stuff. And it's, it's very devastating, um, devastated, broken, shattered, hurt. Hurt isn't, doesn't even come close. I've had nightmares, so many nightmares since this. Um, uh, I've had black widow nightmares where there's just webs all around me and there's black widows biting me. Ironically, during this whole time, I was bitten by a black widow um, in my hand. <laughs> um, it, it's interesting how life reflects back to us so many clues about where we are and what's going on. But I've had so many nightmares and um, about this person 
and just about, like I said, black widows and like all these other kinds of things. Um, I've felt like a physical pain of the hurt from this person that I can't even describe, but I'll try it. It, it is so physical. Um, it feels like I've been stabbed a thousand times in my chest and my heart and it goes into my stomach. Like I just have this extreme pain and extreme sadness. Um, I've been walking in the mornings and I notice when I go walking or running, when I move my body, it brings all those emotions up, which I, so I think what I do is when I'm hurt, I get still. I get very still. I feel very recoiled, you know? So it's been a conscious effort to move my body and to do things. And yes, it's going to bring up even more pain, but I need to do it. So I just got back about an hour ago from my morning walk. And while I was walking, I was just like, it's overwhelming the depth of my pain and my sadness about this situation. Um, I never thought this person would betray me. I trusted them with my life. I love them. I believed in them. Like there's nothing anybody could ever tell me otherwise. And I did have some people tell me some clues about this person, but I... I really, I still to this day, even though he's done this to me, I still believe in him. I just think he's had a devil on one shoulder and an angel on the other, as many of us do in our journey. And I was rooting for him to choose the angel or whatever. I was rooting for him to choose himself, to choose his spirit, to choose his highest self. Um, and there's people around him that want him to choose the other side, want him to choose the ego world of looking good and money and status. And, you know, and it's interesting because I see some people that have come into his life that are jealous of what he's accomplished and that they've been planting little seeds of him not feeling good about himself. And so that's really fed into that part of himself because make no mistake about it. It doesn't matter if he had a thousand people around him. Um, that didn't believe in him and that wanted him to choose the ego side of life. At the end of the day, he chose to choose that side. That's him. That's on him. That's in him. I don't blame anyone around him. Um, but that's 100% him. And that, that makes me sad from like a spiritual point of view. Um, because I really was rooting for him to manifest his dream and live inside of that because when he first told me about his dream, it was he had so much happiness about it. And this was many years ago. And he had so much happiness about it in a genuine desire to share something good with others that he loved. And then when we started to do it, people did love it. People loved it. And so it worked. Like what he was trying to do was working. But anyways, I, it, it, I'll probably talk about this type of thing in a future episode but about how people around us will plant seeds of doubt in us and they'll come back around to water those seeds. And if you don't become hyper vigilant and very aware of how the people in your life are either supporting you or trying to destroy what you're doing, you will maybe be led down a path that ultimately you don't really want. Um, but I know at the end of the day, Wayne Dyer always says, when you, squeeze, when you squeeze an orange, orange juice comes out. So if you don't have it in you to be a certain way, nothing is going to come out of you that isn't you. So that's why I know that even though I'm hurt and, you know, I'm human, some part of me wants to lash out at him because I want to be like, wait, what? Like, I'm so pissed that this person is like doing this to me. And, um, but I wouldn't because... It's not who I am. You can squeeze me. You can put pressure on me. You can, you know, you can hate me. You can do whatever you want. But, you know, something that isn't me isn't going to come out of me. And that's just not me to be that way. Whereas this person was squeezed by life circumstances and by pressure from family and friends. And something came out that I thought was not really what it was. I thought, no, that couldn't possibly, you know, 
there can't be tomato juice coming out of that orange. No way, you know, but that's what it was, you know, and it's a big thing for me to accept when I really love somebody and not talking about every single person in my life. I'm talking about like key people when I really love them. It's really hard for me sometimes to accept if they're making a choice that's hurtful, either hurtful to themselves. I mean, ultimately all of, you know, if it's hurtful to others, it's hurtful to yourself, but it's really hard for me to wrap my head around that sometimes. And so that's been part of my journey, part of my lesson. Um, but so I'm pretty broken right now and I'm pretty hurt and I've wanted to give up on everything. And, um, I've pushed through, I've, you know, I've got this film festival, my Aganart film festival is coming up in September. This is the third year. It's amazing. Great films, great locations, planning, you know, parties and different things. And it's very fun. I've got my death talk podcast and I've been interviewing people a lot um, trying to be regular there and sort of pick it up. It's been like, oh my God, it's been so long since I had had new interviews. So I'm picking that back up again. Got a lot of great interviews. Um, and then I also, I help market the farms up in Northern California. Um, and they have all their events like in June. So it's very, very busy for me right now. It's very, very, very busy, which all this stuff happened right around that time. But Maybe that's a good thing because, you know, I don't know where I would be in my head if I weren't busy. Sometimes being busy is good. Um, so, yeah, I'm planning the film festival. I've got all these, you know, farm events. Then I'm also doing a summer movie night series at two locations, possibly three. Um, so I got one at a winery, one at a lavender farm, and the other one, I'm not going to tell you yet. <laughs> But um, anyway, so yeah, I mean, I'm happy and I'm busy and I'm doing stuff, right? But this other thing is so huge and so devastating and so hurtful um, that it's really made me not want to live. I've gone back to that. And remember, I told you that's how it was for me after Derek died and then after Michael died. And it's taken me many years to even want to live. It took me many years. And then I did. And I had a purpose and I started to say, okay, good. Then if I'm going to live after all this destruction of myself, um, then I have to do life from my heart. Like I can't do stuff because pressure from others or from society or from even myself, my own expectations. I have to do things from my heart. I have to feel also like it's really important to me to give back, to give to people like People always try to say like, oh, you shouldn't do that because what are they doing for you? It's like you you have to get out of that mindset. Like you have to really just like radical empathy, you know, like, um, oh gosh, what is his name? I can't remember his name all of a sudden. Um, I'll get his name. But, you know, you really, we have to, we have to stop thinking about what's in it for me. Well, what am I getting? You know what? Sometimes we just have to, we have to live from our heart and know that everything will be okay, especially if we're taking care of ourselves emotionally and otherwise. But, you know, so I've, I've, I come from my, a place of my, in my heart, you know, and the whole thing with, I have dreams, damn it. Like that angst, there's a couple different reasons why that's there. And there's so many times I wanted to change the name of this podcast to something deeper and more meaningful and maybe more esoteric, but this name is just stuck. And so I'm like, all right, whatever, this is the name. But one of the pieces of the angst is about saying I have dreams, damn it, is because um, there's something specific I feel like I need to um, accomplish in this life. And I don't know what it is on paper. I couldn't tell you, like, I couldn't write it down. I don't know what it is. It's a feeling. And I'm going towards that feeling. And even though I'm doing so many things and like probably the number one thing that I love doing is this podcast. I would have to say this podcast is my number one favorite thing because it feels the most like it's coming from my soul. It's coming from the deepest part of myself. Um, and I'm hopefully helping another, you know, dream warrior on the path. That's that makes me feel very like my life is worth something because I hopefully can help you, the listener. Um, maybe like some story jogs something in your mind or 
gets you to, you know, get up the next day and keep going. That's really important to me. And I'm going to get back to that in a second. But Death Talk Podcast is also important to me, but it's also interesting to me. Like I, I think it's healthy for me. I definitely get something out of that. Definitely. Like it keeps me talking about death, which I think is healthy because I think normally I probably wouldn't talk about it. I would probably just like let Derek and Michael's deaths become like a memory, not deal with it until I have to deal with it again, until I lose someone close to me again, or if, you know, whatever. Um, but Death Talk Podcast keeps me talking, which is what I think we all should do. And I think it's healthy. And and I love learning about everybody's near-death experiences or their end-of-life businesses or whatever. I just think it's interesting. So that podcast has been really great for me and I enjoy it. The film festival is very meaningful to me. Um, it's the films and the stories are so important. And, you know, I was screening a bunch of films the other day for myself. I'm have to watch all these films to try to figure out, you know, the flow of what we watch on what nights and whatever. And I just start sobbing sometimes. I start sobbing because I'm like, this is so important. This is a person's story. This is a farm in Ireland. And they're desperately trying to do X, Y, Z. And here's this story now. And now I can share this story with people in Northern California. And it increases people's empathy. And that's important to me. I love that. And that's why I like to be a filmmaker. I like to bring people to something that they wouldn't probably sit with or look at normally. And the film can go there like a fly <laughs> landing on the wall and just sort of bring that world to another person. So I think that's good. So the film festival, I really like for that reason, like the content, but also I just, I've always liked having parties. I like events. Um, I like creating exper positive experiences for people. So, you know, this year, last year was the fire. It was during COVID and then it was um, the fire. So I had you know, during COVID, we couldn't do any movies inside. The first year, we were in a great theater. So the second year, last year, um, was COVID. So I had planned all these farms that I was working with to do all the screenings outside. And then the fire came through, the wildfire, which I can't, I haven't even talked to you guys fully about my trauma of dealing with and living through a devastating wildfire that comes through the town and kills people, kills animals, kills wild animals, and burns down old trees and homes and sheds and for miles. And like, you can't even know what kind of trauma that is. And that's another thing that's happened probably since I've really talked to you from my heart is that. And I, I do want to get, I will talk about that more in another episode. But um, so there was the fire and that burned like a bunch of the locations of the farms. The farmers lost their farms. And so I couldn't screen there, obviously. And also the fires were still going on in the area and it was extremely smoky and the air quality was really bad. But I had, I was just about ready to put the tickets on sale the next morning when the fire ripped through the town that night. So I, you know, did some soul searching and I decided that I felt like it was important to keep putting something meaningful into the world, especially in that town that had suffered. And, you know, these are films from all over the world. I start from no the previous year in November. When I start looking for films, I start, you know, putting out a call for entries. So it's a long time to get to that point in September to just go, oh, well, we're not going to do it, you know? So um, I went ahead with it and I, and I made a bunch of the screenings fundraisers for farmers who had lost things and raising awareness about what's going on. So a lot of people in the town that didn't have the fire had no real connection. They knew people lost something, but they didn't, there was no real connection to it. So I would do these screenings and they would, the person who lost something would get up and speak to everybody. Um, and, you know, we just show different videos of their property or whatever. So it was like a way of like connecting those dots. And again, it's about raising empathy. And that's something that's really important to me that we become more aware of our environment and aware of each other and each other's stories. One, so we don't feel so alone. And two, so that we're kinder to each other. That's really important to me. So I decided to go ahead with the film festival. It was, instead of being over a weekend, which it was in the first film festival, the first year, this one went over four weeks because you can only screen movies at night. And so you know, I can only do like one movie a night and I have like 10 hours of, you know, content. 
So it had to be over a bunch of nights. And then also, um, what was the other thing? I don't know. It was just, it was extremely hard because it was like the smoke everywhere and you have masks and, but it kind of worked in some ways because I asked people to bring their own chairs. So it was like sanitary. And so people brought like camping chairs. They brought their own picnics. The first year I tried to do food event stuff. And so obviously last year I didn't because of COVID and the fire and just said, you know, bring a picnic, come with your favorite friends, you know, bring a camping chair. We're going to screen this stuff outside. So it was great. It turned out to be great. I got new locations when I put out a notice like, hey, my location's burned. Does anybody you know, want to open up their place? And I heard from a lot of great people in the community. And I've actually, I'm now continuing having some movies like at Araceli Farms in Dixon, which is a lavender farm. We're doing the summer series there. She's also hosting a screening night this coming September for the regular festival. And then Tolinas Winery, which I'm doing the summer screening series at. She's in Fairfield and um, her name's Lisa. So, you know, she's pretty cool. <laughs> but um, yeah, so that is another um, location that opened up to me because of the fires. So, you know, good things happen sometimes out of bad things. But so this year is going to be the same kind of thing, but now I'm going to incorporate some food and wine and, you know, whatever, some kind of stuff like that and the party. And it's going to be the best of the first year and the best of the second year put together. So it's going to be pretty awesome. We're definitely staying with outdoor screenings because it just, there's something special about sitting under the stars and watching movies. But, um, so that, this is my busy time. This is my crazy time. It's absolutely insane, you know, doing the festival, doing all the sponsors, doing all the ads, doing all the, you know, press release, the website, you know, all the trailers, getting all the locations. I mean, it's a big, huge undertaking that I love. I love doing it. It fulfills me um, immensely. It's a lot of work. I do have a lot of client work that I do. I do videos. I do web stuff. I do social media stuff. So I'm very busy. Um but that feeling I was telling you about, that I have dreams, damn it, feeling, it's not touching that. I don't feel a sense of fulfillment from any of these things. I mean, when I screened my film, and then I also film, finished my film, Soul Providers, my first feature film, and I screened that at the Valley Film Festival in North Hollywood, that was amazing too. That also happened in the last few years. And um, I'm very proud of myself about that because it was very hard for whatever reason, psychologically most mostly. Um and so there was a lot of things I've done since Derek and Michael's deaths. Like my life has exploded with projects and things that I feel called to do. And I'm so happy about that. And I'm so happy that I'm doing these things. But yeah, definitely that feeling of like, and that feeling that I'm looking for or, or going towards, it hasn't been fully touched on yet. And it kind of did, like I said, in, in the screening of my film, and then also when I'm at the film festival, my film festival, there's a couple moments where I'm looking at everybody and I get that feeling. I do. I, you know, the first year I was in a big, huge movie theater and I looked, I went upstairs and I was up in the balcony and I looked down at everybody and I, they were like paying attention to the film. And one of the films I remember was from, it was an animated film from Iran. And I, I know what I felt when I saw it. And it was great to see people like really paying attention and interested and, you know, whatever, that I just started sobbing because it was this really cool feeling of connecting those dots of like this weird feeling that I just have on my own, like, oh, I'm going to do this thing and I'm, here's this film and I think they might like it. And then you see people liking it. Um, people that don't really know you, they're not doing it to be nice. They actually genuinely like it. That is such a high, that's such a great feeling and anybody listening to this as an artist or an entrepreneur, or you don't even have to be other of those. Just if you've ever wanted to do something for someone else and you did it and they loved it the way you wanted them to love it, that's, that's a great feeling. That's a great feeling. So there's been so many like highs in all this, even some messages I get from this podcast, that's a high, you know, messages I get from the death talk podcast, that's a high. Um, when someone reaches out and said, I just had an author um, her, her publishing company reached out to me for Death Talk Podcast and they said she specifically wanted us to contact you because she's a fan of your podcast. And I'm like, 
what? Like, <laughs> cause sometimes, you know, you just honestly, a lot of this stuff, we're just by ourselves doing it. Podcast recording on bus by myself right now, you know, and you're just hoping, I mean, I know that somebody else is going to be listening to it. I see the stats, people from all over the world are listening to this podcast, which is like mind blowing. And I love it. Um, but it's a, it's another thing when you hear from people or when you see their reaction, it's extremely fulfilling. That's the only word I can think of. It's fulfilling. It feels like a high for me and I love it. Um, but yeah, so there's still something else that I'm trying to pursue, which is great, which means I'm still alive and I'm supposed to be here. Um, so there is, there is some stuff I'm going to change and I'm going to start turning my direction towards that feeling a little bit more now, now that I've got all this stuff that I love to do. Um, and I've changed my life so much from, from the time of Derek and Michael's deaths and me burning out, um, in LA doing all that stuff, like, la, 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 la. I was doing things, doing things, doing things. And I don't regret anything that I've done because everything I've done has been a building block to the next thing, to the next thing, to the next thing. Um, but yeah, so I feel good about everything that I'm doing and I love what I'm doing and I love the journey of it. And I love that I'm my own boss. I'm deciding how often I record episodes. I'm deciding who I interview. I'm deciding like how the edit is. I'm deciding my film and what's next for me. What's the next series I want to do with my film stuff. I'm the one who decides what happens with the film festival. So it's really great. And it's a wonderful feeling. The, the other side of that though, is that a lot of people don't like what you do. Not a lot of people. There's some people that won't like what you do. They'll think like, I can, I know there's people in my life. They're like, who do you think you are? Like, why do you think you should talk about this? You're not even really successful. Like, what are you doing? What are you even doing with your life? I can feel it coming from certain people. Um, or, you know, why do you talk about death? God, you're so morbid. Or, you know, whatever. Like, why are you even having a, a film festival? Who cares? I can feel this coming from people. And I am now, I'm now realizing that it is coming from people. I'm not crazy. And keep going, put up the blinders, put my impenetrable bubble around myself, you know, my aura and just keep, keep going and don't wallow in it. Don't even give it any attention. Just know that that's going to happen. Even people that you love, like people that I love that I really want to be friends with, don't really think that I'm great. And they think that who cares about me? And they treat me like that. Um, people I have to work with people that are either, you know, kind of quasi clients or whatever, um, associates of clients, not necessarily an actual client. So I don't think I would work with someone who thought that of me, but I do feel this coming from people. And, um, it's, it's hard for me to accept it because I feel like if the afterlife or the other life, cause if this is actually the dream to be alive right now in this way, in the physical dimension, if this is like what people say in the near death experiences, they say, when they cross over, that's our true life. And this is like almost like a hologram, or this is an, a place that we've come to experience things and learn. So if that's true, and then I'm more in touch with my spirit right now, and I have been the entire time I've been here on earth as me, <laughs> um, then when someone, I know that in the, on the other side, we're, we're love. We love each other. We, you know, we don't have the ego, we don't have the survival, fear of survival and all that other stuff that happens in the physical dimension. So if we come from that place, there's so much love that's just, it's just there. And so being in this physical world, and this goes back to like, this life for me has been very hard. And when people act in non-loving, non-kind way, unkind ways, it hurts me so deeply, so incredibly deeply. It throws me off. And, um, I've had to really learn to kind of put on blinders, but not change who I am. Like I can't stop being hurt by that, but I can keep going even though I'm feeling hurt. And I used to stop because it, like I said before, I recoil and I get still when I'm hurt. And so I was always stopping with what I was doing. And so now I'm like, okay, look, I'm feeling crazy and I'm feeling hurt. And I'm going to keep going. I'm going to get up and I'm going to keep doing stuff. I'm going to keep putting the film festival together, even though I can tell some people have negative views of me. 
And I'm going to keep doing my films, even though some people might think it wasn't very good. Who knows? I'm just saying, so, you know, I'm sure there's someone out there that's like a hater on something, <laughs> but I have to do that. And that's why I want to encourage you as well, that, you know, the most successful people have haters. Charles Barkley, who used to play for the Phoenix Suns, I'm a huge basketball fan, by the way, um, he said that when he became famous, it's not like now more people loved him. He said there's always been a percentage of people who love him and hate him. And then when he became famous, it was the same percentage. It was just more people. And so I think that it's like to think that as you're pursuing your dream or as you're putting your thing out there that makes you happy, that then everything's going to be great is sort of not really realistic because the realistic thing is there's always going to be people that don't like you, that don't like me, that don't like good things. You know, they might be like, you're too nice. Or I don't, you know, why are you always doing stuff for other people? You're making us all look bad. I've had someone say that to me before. I'm like, what? Like at a job, some office job. I was like, so me helping you is making everybody look, what? (laughs) Yeah. Anyways. So we have to learn how to deal with all that. We have to learn how to like, you know, get through all of that. Um, So I've always felt like I was too much for this world, always. I always felt like I was too loud, too happy. I got too excited. Um, And then I was too sad, too emotional, too loving, too this, too that. And it wasn't just because I thought that way. It was like constantly coming back to me. You know, my dad telling me, you know, keep your voice down. Don't get so excited. Why are you, you know, it's just the world. It's not just my dad, my mom, you know, relatives, babysitters, teachers, jobs, everything was, it's just always being reflected back to me. I'm too much. I'm too this, I'm too that. And so I've tried so many different times in my life to repress that, to repress that energy of me, you know, just being me. And since Derek died, that's when it really started. Michael, Michael's death also helped, but Derek's death, I can't repress who I am really. I can't. I'm, I've, the longer I'm getting out from Derek's death, the more I, I've noticed I've started repressing myself again. Um, but also I had this situation going on with this friend that wasn't being honest with me. And so I think that was part of it too, was that I was trying to kind of walk on eggshells and figure out what was going on. So I was kind of pushing things in, like probably if I were to fully like, you know, I would have just been like, look, I know you're not being truthful. I can feel it. I know it. I did tell him a couple of times. I'm like, you know, I'm psychic. I mean, he knows he's always like, you know, you know, you always know. I would always call at the right time or I would always bring up something that there's no way I could have known. And he's like, oh my God, how'd you know that? So he knows that I'm very intuitive And so for him to even try to pull this over on me is just so shocking to me on top of it, which just goes to tell me that the ego is a very strong negative force. It really is. It really can wrap its dark uh, wings all the way around us and cover up our eyes and make us see the world through that dark lens. And... um, that's what I feel like. But anyways, um, so I've just always felt that way. I've always felt like, you know, I am too much, too much, too much. So since this whole thing and the reason why I started all the podcasts and the film festival and all this stuff is because these are actually all the things I've really wanted to do. And people, other people think it's so much or quote unquote, too much. Like you're doing too much. I'm not, I'm doing exactly what I want to do. It's not too much. I felt like before I spent too many hours doing things like I couldn't stand and didn't feel like a good use of my, my time here on earth. Like I really don't understand why so many people waste their entire lives doing things that they don't want to do. I'm not saying it's a glamorous route, the one I'm on. It's actually very hard in a lot of ways. I'm always trying to figure out how to monetize these things that I'm doing but not putting that first, because if I put that first, it changes the whole energy. So I'm trying to like, you know, live from my heart and do these things I feel called to do, then obviously make a living at that so that I'm not, you know, how, what else am I going to do? I have to, I have to make money, but you know, there's only so many hours in the day. So how am I going to do this? So 
this podcast, basically, I just want to say this podcast is very important to me. And now that I'm no longer friends with that person, they're not in my life. I'm not investing in their dream anymore. My energy isn't going towards them. They have made it clear that that route, that category is gone and it's gone in me as well. I, I don't, I don't, um, view people who are cruel in a good light. Um, I think people who go out of their way to be cruel to someone else, even if the person's been borderline and a jerk to you, which I have not been, but even if that were to happen, I still just don't like cruel people. I think cruelty is just shit. I don't like it. And this person is being cruel. And that is, that's a nail in the coffin for me. I, I will never have this person in my life again. I will never talk to them. I will never be around them. I will never know anything about them. I just don't, this is, and I'm not even like this, you guys. I'm not even like this. I'm friends with people from grade school, from kindergarten. I love, I value having like these long connections, but I value putting the limited amount of energy we have in a day. I value putting that into people and things that, um, (laughs) I don't want to say are worthy of it because it sounds very judgy, but like if this person is cruel, I don't want to put energy towards that. Um, anytime a person has a cruelty vibe, like they're not kind, they're not, um, loving, even if you have to choose, like you don't want the friendship anymore or you, you don't want, you want to stop doing something you're doing. Like if someone's helping me with the film festival and you want to stop doing that, as long as you say that, if you come to me and you say, look, I, I've had all these changes happen in my life right now. I need to go in a different direction. I have zero problem with that. I have zero problem with anybody changing their mind and wanting to do something different. It's if they try to destroy, you know, me or destroy the thing that they're trying to get away from so that they can deal with the guilt that they have or whatever. And they're cruel about it. And they're, malicious and it goes on over a long period of time. No. I mean, what am I going to do with that? Nothing. I don't want, I don't even want to plug into that. So I've unplugged from that person, which was a huge, huge part of my psyche went into this person in their dream. A huge part of my actual life energy. I did physical things for the person. Um, and I used my creative spirit, my creative energy was being funneled into this person, into their personal growth and into the manifestation of their dream. Um, and then like little lakes that, and rivers that, you know, shoot out from that, all the kind of people surrounding that person, helping all of them with their stuff and sort of kind of trying to create this comprehensive thing. Also, you know, getting involved in other things bigger picture stuff that then led back to this person. It's getting hard to talk about this. I'm probably gonna have to finish it up because it's like too hard to not bring up some type of identifiable information, but it was big. It's big, it's big, it's big. And now that that's, that plug has been pulled out of that person and all the stuff that goes along with them, guess where that plug is going? Well, ultimately it's back to me, but guess where it's going after that to you. I am giving my heart and soul to this podcast, to you, the listener, to you, my fellow spirit warrior, dream life walker. You're here to find the truth in yourself, the truth in your path. You're here to manifest something or you're here to experience something, teach something, learn something, all the above, whatever. I am 100% here for you now. And I was, originally I was, but there was a part of me that always kind of thought about, I was holding back a little bit because I was thinking about how this person sometimes listens to this podcast. Um, And I was just, part of me was just trying to keep helping them. And so I never wanted to like, I don't know how to describe it, but there was just part of me still being siphoned off over to that person. And maybe that's a sign too, that, that that's not really a good sign. Like it shouldn't even be like that, which I'll explore another day, um, and go deep into that another time. But I know this is very long and I appreciate you listening to all this. And I just really hope you get, you hear my heart and that you know where I'm coming from 
and uh, that I just, I really, I care about you and I want you to be successful and I want you to stay on your path. And you might say like, well, you don't even know me. Like I'm just some person in wherever, I don't know, Germany listening to this. Actually, there's been a person in, um, oh my gosh, why am I draw, drawing a blank right now? <laughs> I'm picturing basil. It's not basil. What is going on? My brain. Okay. I'm in this whole other thing, but the point is regardless of where you are, if you're in Iowa or you're in Russia or you're in, you know, Germany or you're in Hawaii or whatever, wherever you're listening to this right now, yes, I don't actually know you physically, but I know you in my heart. I know you because you are like me. I know you because I feel you. And before I met Derek, I felt his spirit. I knew who he was. And when I met him, that's why it just felt so natural and comfortable. I'm like, yeah, I feel that again, but it feels bigger. It feels like there's more of you. And it's not just one person like with Derek, it was one person. But with you, with this right now, I feel it. And I feel like I am yet, you know, I'm just one voice on your path. And I want to make sure that you keep going. I mean, that's just it. I, that's, I've been saying that from the very beginning, but I don't see how this podcast is really a monetizable podcast. Maybe it will be someday, but like, that's not even my focus. My number one focus with this podcast is to legitimately share the deepest parts of my journey with you so that you think about some of the things that are going on in your life. So that you maybe dig a little bit deeper when you're thinking about how you're approaching something or when you're thinking about the people in your life, your own tests, allies, and enemies. You know, I really want you to examine this and think about it a little bit more and think about what stops you from fulfilling that journey for yourself. What is holding you up? What I feel is that some people just don't want me to do well in life and don't think I'm worthy of anything. And I can feel that. And once I feel that, it it hurts me and crushes me. It makes me not want to keep going. It makes me just want to recoil and just sort of survive life until it's my time to die. And uh, it's something that I have to confront. I have to look at that. One of the good things, quote unquote, about after Derek died and after Michael died, you're kind of insulated because this the loss, the pain of losing that person is so incredible that I felt insulated from, I really didn't give a shit what anybody thought about me. I really didn't. It was the first time in my life I didn't care what people thought about me. I've always cared because I can feel it and it really hurts me. And I think my pain, my grief was so intense. I couldn't finally, for the first time in my life, feel what other people were feeling when they were around me. I didn't care. I was numb. I was like, whatever. I don't care. I don't care if you think I'm talking about Derek too much. I don't care if you think I'm crying too much. I don't care about any of that stuff. And it was liberating. It was the first time I ever felt like that. Well, now I'm just sort of back to caring about what people think again. But the difference is, the elixir of the situation is, I will feel what people are feeling a lot of the time. I will, because it's who I am. But I can't let it stop me. It can bring me to my knees. It can bring me to weeks of crying and nightmares and crushing pain. But it doesn't have to be something that stops me. And it won't stop me. And I'm not going to be stopped by any of this stuff. And I don't want you to be either, regardless of what's going on with you. There is a reason why we're here. I don't know what the reason is, but there's a reason why I'm still alive and Derek and Michael aren't. And other people on my path. My friend Christina, my friend Alex, my friend Michael, my friend Will. I mean, there's been so many people. Don, you know, there's been so many people I've lost in the last, just in that cluster of deaths. And it's like, why am I here? Why am I here? Well, I don't know why I'm here, but I am here. And there has to be a purpose to that. And you're here too. And you're listening to me. You've somehow found me in the sea of the thousands and thousands of podcasts. You found me. You found this podcast. There has to be a reason to that. And I'm dedicated to helping you keep going. 
and to pay attention to everything going on around you and learn as much as you can while you're here because we are here, I guess, like on some kind of mission, you know, we're here from the spirit world. We've got our flesh suits on. We've got gravity. We've got ego, fear, hatred, meanness, but we also still have love, beauty, inspiration, uh, connection, fulfillment. Like there's a lot of great things about this dimension, even though there's a lot of hard things. You have become so much more important to me since, you know, in the last few years, since all this shit fell apart for me. And it's like, even more so you're important to me, even more. So yeah, <laughs> I hope that this resonates with someone out there. If you are going through something and, you know, Joseph Campbell talks about, um, shapeshifters and how, you know, people can just completely switch on a dime. This person was a total shapeshifter. And when I, as I'm saying, I know, as I'm thinking about it, I really realized there's been so many times throughout my friendship with this person that they've shapeshifted. They've betrayed me before. They have betrayed me before. And I forgave them. And um, it's interesting because now there's another betrayal, but this one's the sort of nail in the coffin. And I'm not even the type of person to harbor anything. I usually forgive everybody. I'm fine. But this is different because I don't, I don't, want people in my life who treat me like that. I just don't. And, um, I think that there's something broken about him and that he, he's living a lie. Basically. That's my interpretation of what's going on. I think he's been lying to himself for so long that he doesn't think there's anything wrong with lying and that he thinks it's inconsequential. Like who cares? I mean, what difference does it make? Yeah. It's either a tomato or an orange. I mean, you know, whatever it's, it's whatever it is. It's juice. It's yeah, whatever. And that way of being is so anti everything that I am that now my path has taken a sharp turn away from that type of self-deception. And I, I don't want that in my realm. And I, and I really think that having this podcast has given me a place of accountability and I really want to be truthful with you and I want to tell you guys what I'm going through and I want to tell you the lessons I've learned and how can I do that if I just start lying to myself, if I start like pretending certain things are happening or, you know, it just, it's going to start messing everything up. I can't possibly do that. I can't, you know, I can't maintain that. I couldn't maintain a lie. So I have to take this sharp right turn away from that person and away from that vibe. And you know, when I think about it, since Derek and Michael's death, I've had a lot of mini and bigger mid-level fallings out types of situation with people. And I think it's really because I'm coming from a more genuine place now. And anything that's not about self-respect and respecting others and about self-honesty truly. Cause when I think about all the people that I've had a negative interaction with or a falling out with since Derek and Michael have died, they are people that don't look at themselves and don't want to look at themselves. And maybe even some of them have addiction problems. Um, and that's like the escapism, like they don't really want to. And that's what I'm sort of turning away from. I'm turning away from, looking, you know, the other way for a whole big chunks of the person that I'm friends with. I'm turning away from that and I'm going towards, I'm doubling down on truth and I'm doubling down on knowing myself and being honest and respecting myself and saying, you know, I don't ask for anything from others that I don't already give to them and to myself. So I'm not asking for something that's crazy. I just want honesty, respect, um, and someone who's willing to do the work on themselves as well. And when people have a limit, like, well, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to look at myself. And I don't want you to ask me to look at myself. There's not really anywhere else you can take that. You can't because the person has free will and they, they've chosen that. And you can't, you're not going to thrive in that environment for very long. And you might think like I thought where it's like, oh, well, it's just my friend or it's just my relative or it's just whatever. And it doesn't really matter. It's just this thing and they're like that. And I just block it out. I did that for many years, but because I also wasn't coming from truth, I'm also on a journey of trying to, 
you know, live my own truth. So I probably go between being really brutally honest with myself and then going into denial as well. But there's going to come opportunities in your life where you can be even more truthful and more honest consistently with yourself and with your vibe and with what's important to you. You know, it's like, it's, it's just, you just, that's what's happening. And you just get closer and closer to like really being there for yourself and really living in truth. And that's where I'm kind of headed now. The wound is where the light enters you. Rumi. I love that quote. And I also, when I first, right after Michael, Derek and Michael's deaths, I started going to Unity Church, which I like. I'm not a religious person, but it's sort of like a conglomeration of all these different backgrounds. And it's very open and it's much more the way that I think. And I wrote, they said to write a message on these rocks and I'll, I'll try to take a picture of it because I think I still have the rock. And I wrote broken, but whole. And that's how I feel right now. I feel like I'm broken into a thousand pieces, but I'm still whole. I'm still me. And I'm really glad about that. No matter how broken I get, no matter how many things fall apart, I'm still me and I'm still, all the pieces are there. I'm still me. So now I want to read a little bit from Chris Vogler's The Writer's Journey, which takes from Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey, and I've talked about it many times on this podcast. But in um, stage six of the wheel, and if if you're wondering what I'm talking about with the different stages, if you look at the podcast art on the um, bulletin board, I have little notes. All those different things are the different stages. So, you know, you have your ordinary world, then you have your call to adventure, And so let's go all the way to stage six, which is tests, allies, and enemies. And I'm going to read a couple excerpts from this chapter. So for me, all of this happened um, in the special world, which is the world after Derek and Michael died, the world that I entered after that. And I had a lot of tests, definitely. I had a lot of allies, people that were there for me, people that helped me at different times. And I really, really appreciated them, including this person I was talking about. But also a lot of those people are now, I wouldn't say enemies, but like maybe they would be in that category. People that I don't want to be friends with anymore and that I don't consider an ally. Um, And so it's been an interesting, it's been an interesting journey and it's definitely the special world for me. So I'm going to read a little bit from this chapter. Now the hero fully enters the mysterious, exciting, special world, which Joseph Campbell called a dream landscape of curiously fluid, ambiguous forms where he must survive a succession of trials. It's a new and sometimes frightening experience for the hero. No matter how many schools he has been through, he's a freshman all over again in this new world. So there's another part here that says, we seekers are in shock. This new world is so different from the home where we've always known. Not only are the terrain and the local residents different, the rules of this place are strange as they can be. Different things are valued here, and we have a lot to learn about the local currency, customs, and language. Strange creatures jump out at you. Think fast. Don't eat that. It could be poison. Exhausted by the journey across the desolate threshold zone, we're running out of time and energy. Remember, our people back in the home tribe are counting on us. Enough sightseeing. Let's concentrate on the goal. We must go where the food and game and information are to be found. There are skill. There are skills will be tested and will come one step closer to what we speak. So for me, because I, you know, I was in LA and I was like all around the industry, that was kind of like my normal world, I guess, in a weird way. And then the special world to me was being around people just working and living life. I'd never really wanted to de- devil to, you know, go too deep into like why people don't pursue something big 
while they're here. Like whether it's, it doesn't have to be a career, but anything that's big, like I want to walk the Camino de Santiago, or I want to, you know, I don't know what, start an orphanage. I don't know what it is, but like the fact that people don't want to do things that are great while they're here has always been like a huge question mark to me. I really don't understand that. So I've never wanted to understand those. Like I think of them as people in the middle because, you know, you think about people on one end are like out there trying to make things happen, start businesses, you know, whatever, volunteer, help people, or maybe they want to be a sports hero. Maybe they're like an athlete and they're training. Maybe they're a writer or a filmmaker or a dancer or even a doctor or whatever. Like there's these things where people feel called to do. It takes a lot of energy to do it. It takes a lot of time and they're doing that. Those people are like one extreme. Then the other extreme are people who are kind of like naysayers, talk shit about other people, always fixated on people who are doing stuff, but then they're always talking negatively about them or about what they're doing, like haters, trolls, whatever. And then the majority of people, I think, are in the middle. They're not necessarily on the forefront trying to do something great in the world or do something big in their world or whatever, but they're not really outwardly hating anybody either. They actually are very indifferent, but then there probably are some flecks of hate in there too. But like, they're really just kind of like go to work every day. Um, They're the opposite of me, by the way, opposite of me. And I have tried to be this kind of person because I grew up in this environment in Arizona growing up, like just regular people. I didn't know anybody that wanted to be an actress. I didn't know anybody that wanted to be a writer a filmmaker. I didn't know anybody like that. Not a single soul. Um, but you know, it's like they're regular people that life works out for them in that regular way. They wake up usually in the morning, they go to work. Um, they work all day. They're just like person that works and I'm grateful for them. Don't get me wrong. They're just, it's such a foreign world to me. So if you hear me talking like that, it's literally a foreign world to me. And so they get up, they go do their stuff. They, they're not pining away for anything big. They don't have something they're trying to do. Literally, they're like TGIF. They're excited about Friday. They're excited about, you know, this trip they've planned with their girlfriend or boyfriend or husband or wife. Um, that's their life. And they go in and out like that's that's it. That's what it is. Um, I, wow, like I don't even, I don't know. So for me, I've always had this sense of like, I'm here to do something. I'm here on earth. I'm here in this physical dimension. I'm here to do something. I'm here to accomplish something or give something or I don't know what. That's that thing. I don't know. But um, I'm always putting myself out there, putting energy out there, wanting to help everybody around me, wanting to improve things. Um, I had a boss tell me one time when I was at a job, I was an assistant. I was his assistant. And he told me that I was an entrepreneur at heart. And I never heard anybody say that to me because my family was always like, oh, are you, you know, how long can you keep that job? And are they going to promote you? And what are your benefits? How much do you get paid? How far, how far is it to drive to there? And I know many of you listening to this are probably like, yeah, that's regular life. I get it. But it's not the way that I think at all. It, that's why it's been so hard for me here because I don't think like this at all, at all, at all. (laughs) Have I emphasized that enough at all? Um, But yeah, so I really entered that world after Derek and Michael's deaths. And, uh, you know, that's that world helped me. It was there for me because I think the other world, it's like there's so many big things happening all the time. I was really tired of that. And I took a break from that and I went into like regular life stuff, which it's ordinary world in one way. But in my hero's journey, it was my special world. And in that special world, there were different rules about money, how you spend your time, you know? And so like, if I'm doing a bunch of things, not for money, and I'm trying to help a bunch of people, and even though I'm not, you know, I'm not getting my hair done every freaking couple of weeks, or I'm not, you know, I'm not doing all those things that you would normally do if you had like a regular job and that was like your normal life. Like if I'm just doing stuff that I feel called to do, that's going to be something that's going to bother those people in that, in that world, in that special world. And that is definitely what I felt every day, all the time. Um, it was definitely a special world for me and I had to learn their way of doing things instead of just kind of 
weaving in and out of that world. You know, I'd have to get a job to have money, but I wouldn't become of that world. I had my own world in my head all the time. But after their deaths, I had to kind of enter that world and blend in. Ugh. I had to blend in. And it was kind of like the way that I survived. I just had to like be there. But then on the other hand, I have this whole other thing happening where I also have shot into like the stratosphere in terms of like, I have to do everything that's in my heart while I'm alive. And so I've got this kind of inner revolution happening, but then I've got the outer world that I'm in that I've, I need to play by their rules in a way up to a point, you know, up to a point. So it's, it's been a stressful time <laughs> the past like five years. It's been extremely, extremely repressive, but also at times explosive, like in terms of me just coming out and being myself. And then, but mostly repressive, me pushing things down and then sensing all this deception coming from a friend and, uh, and feeling like absolutely, I've had so much vertigo in the past few years. And I always know when I have vertigo, there's something going on. There's some, I mean, yes, it's allergies. Yes. It's the inner ear and all that stuff. Yes. But it's also psychosomatically, usually when I'm dealing with deception, when I'm dealing with something I don't, that I don't understand, like I'm getting messages in my body that don't match what the person is saying. And uh, I, I'm not always conscious of it all happening, but whenever I look back at times when I've had vertigo, it's always coincided with um, sort of a situation where there's been deception involved. So it's kind of interesting. Let me read a little bit more from this book, and then I'm going to end this very long episode. Okay, so yes, you're going to make a lot of friends during this world, special world, and I have. I've made a lot of really... Some people I think I'll be friends with for a very long time that I met during this. Some people I thought I was going to be friends a long time, but didn't. That didn't work out. And then other people, um, just I know that they were just there for a minute, and I appreciate them. You know, I don't think there's anything longer or bigger than that. But this part, enemies, I thought this is a short paragraph here. He says, heroes can also make bitter enemies at this stage. They may encounter the shadow or his servants. The hero's appearance in the special world may tip the shadow to his arrival and trigger a chain of threatening events. The cantina sequence in Star Wars sets up a conflict with the villain Jabba the Hutt, which culminates in The Empire Strikes Back. He uses movies and stuff because that's what it's about, writers writing screenplays and stuff, but it's also applicable to our lives, obviously. Enemies include both the villains or antagonists of stories and their underlings. Oh, there's like, there are like five formidable underlings connected to the falling out with his friend that when I think about them, I have so much anger, like, and I know I'll process this and I'll come to a higher level of understanding, but just the human being of me, I get so mad because I've been nothing but good to those people. And the way that they think they're so sneaky and they're just being little followers, is just, oh, I'm just, I'm so mad, but okay. <sighs> um, enemies may perform functions of other archetypes, such as the shadow, the trickster, the threshold guardian, and sometimes the herald. Okay, so we'll get more into these different um, archetypes another time. But I did just want you to know that. Um, and then it says, the new rules, this is another thing about test allies and enemy, enemies, is the new rules. The new world, rules of the special world must be learned quickly by the hero and the audience. As Dorothy enters the land of Oz, she is bewildered when Glinda the Good Witch, Glinda the Good asks, are you a good Witch or a bad witch? In Dorothy's ordinary world in Kansas, there are only bad witches. But in the special world of Oz, witches can be also good and fly in pink bubbles instead of on broomsticks. Another test of the hero is how quickly she can adjust to the new rules of the special world. Yeah, so then he gets into another film analysis. But <sighs> yeah, I mean, I think about how much how much I had to learn the rules there because I've never learned the rules there completely. I've always lived in my own world in my head through grade school and everything. And I, I would try to like, I, I really didn't realize I was so different. You know, I, I thought, 
I would usually blame myself like, oh, I'm just being too sensitive or I'm being too, and I'm, I'm thinking back now and I'm like, wow, I really, I really uh, didn't understand that I was really a stranger in an, a strange land, you know? And I think if I were to realize that when I was a little kid, I would have completely fallen apart. But I did almost completely fall apart because I was always very separate from life and very lonely. And I would like literally talk to the sky and talk to trees. And that's what made me feel like I could feel like they would say to me one day, all this will make sense to you. Just keep going. And I could feel this love coming from like the trees and the moon and the sky. And I felt held by the universe and I always felt safe. And this whole time period, I felt very much like I was on my own. Not that the universe wasn't there for me. I do believe that I'm still being held, but it was much more like a test time. Um, you know, like a little kid, you know, if you're if you're helping a child learn how to walk, you know, there's going to be times where it's going to get up and fall down, get up and fall down. And that's kind of what was happening with me. It's not like I didn't have a loving energy around me, but it was very much I was on my own. And I really had to I, I mean, from everything from and most of the, everything I've talked about in this podcast, but how to like fight for, to be paid what I think my work is worth and my time. Um, that was a very hard thing. It still is. It's getting easier, but like, that was really hard for me. Really hard. Um, especially when people don't really value you or value what you do, but they want what you are. They want what you can do, but they don't value it. It's very strange. Um, but um, yeah, so all of the kind of stuff that I've gone through during this podcast, since the beginning of this podcast, are all things that have been in this special world, which is crazy to me because I kept trying to figure out where am I in the special world right now? Because I was still trying to see this friend and my connection to what was going on there um, in a positive light. So it didn't ever match up with anything. But now that the deception has been revealed and the the cloak of lies has been pulled back. I fully see the truth of everything with this whole person and with my involvement and with everything, all the feelings I had even before this period of time, a lot of things are coming clear. So it's like, I'm realizing now that was the special world. And now I'm in the next phase, which is trying to get back to my ordinary world, which is the life of people who are pursuing their dreams. And so that's why I'm saying like, it's even more important to me to connect with you guys now, because I'm like, you guys are my life. You know, you are my life. If you are a person, I don't mean to say you guys, I always say that, but like, if you're a person that is pursuing something that you feel called to do something you really, really want to do, and then you don't really maybe understand it. Maybe you do understand it, but maybe you don't. You're my people. Okay. Because I have felt like that my whole life. And so we are from the same place. And so I am here like a lighthouse, but a vo voice version to remind you that you're not alone and to keep going. That's it. That's what I want. The final thing I want to read is the last part. In each chapter, he ends the chapter with a little thing about Wizard of Oz, which I think is great. So it's such a good visual for these lessons and these different stages. The Wizard of Oz. Of course, not all heroes go to bars at this stage of the journey. Dorothy encounters her tests, allies, and enemies on the yellow brick road. Like Psyche, or the heroes of many fairy tales, she is wise enough to know that requests for aid on the road should be honored with an open heart. Remember I was talking about being there for people and helping them and not thinking about what's in it for you? You know, people are always like, oh, that person's taking advantage of you. Why are they taking advantage of you? You're following your heart and you're doing what you really want to do and what you feel called to do, then no, they're not. So, I mean, is the, did the scarecrow take advantage of Dorothy because she helped unhook him off of the, the fence or the post? No, she didn't. <laughs> I just think it's ridiculous, but okay. Um, like people are not being giving and helpful anymore because they're always trying to figure out how is it in it for them and how they're being screwed over and like, just stop. Gosh, there's so much insanity. Just come from your heart. If you feel called to help someone or be there for them, or, you know, do an exchange with them, be creative. Everything isn't this like cookie cutter, whatever life. Like it's not like that. We're human beings. We're spirits here. We're here to help each other. Okay. So she earns the loyalty of the scarecrow by helping him, getting him unhooked from his post and by helping him learn to walk. 
Meanwhile, she learns that her enemy, the Wicked Witch, shadows her at every turn and waits for the chance to strike. The witch influences some grumpy apples to become enemies to Dorothy and the Scarecrow. <laughs> influences, exactly. I've had some influences come from my um, enemy and turn some grumpy apple trees against me as well. The Scarecrow proves his worthiness to be on the team by outwitting the trees. He taunts them into throwing apples, which he and Dorothy pick up to eat. Dorothy wins the affection of another ally, the Tin Woodsman, by oiling his joints and listening sympathetically to a sad story of having no heart. The witch appears again, showing her anonymity, whatever, for Dorothy and her allies by hurling a fireball at them. To protect her dog Toto, Dorothy stands up to the blustering of the cowardly lion, a potential enemy or threshold guardian, and ends up making him an ally. The battle lines are clearly drawn. Dorothy has learned the rules of the special world and has passed many tests. Protected by allies, allies and on guard against declared enemies, she is ready to approach the central source of power in the land of Oz. So he says, the phase of tests, allies, and enemies in stories is useful for getting to know you scenes where the character get the characters get acquainted with each other and the audience learns more about them. This stage also allows the hero to accumulate power and information in preparation for the next stage, approach to the inmost cave. That's where I am. I mean, I'm guessing that's probably where I am. <laughs> it is. It is. So that's going to conclude today's podcast episode. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for being a listener. And I appreciate you. <laughs> and I'm here for you. I hope you have a great week. And I look forward to talking with you again soon. Thanks.